Welcome back to the Beyond Luxury podcast, where we don't just talk about the future, we create it. I'm your host, Carlota Rodben. Today, we're diving deep into the pulsating heart of technology and its transformative impact in fashion. Yes, that's right. We're unraveling how artificial intelligence is revolutionizing some of the deepest challenges in fashion. Our guest today, Ahmed Zaidi, the co-founder and CEO of Hiron Technologies, is not just a businessman. He is also an AI researcher at Cambridge University. Ahmed consults with both public and private organizations, making him uniquely poised to offer insights in multiple sectors. If you've ever wondered how technology could make the world of fashion a more sustainable and efficient industry, Ahmed is your guide. Today, we'll discover how leveraging advanced technologies to redefine supply chain and waste management, creating a more purpose-driven future for the luxury industry. Hello, Ahmed, and welcome to Beyond Luxury. Thank you for having me. Really excited to be here. I'm excited as well. Your work is at the intersection of fashion, AI, sustainability, and it's just mind-blowing to see how all of these different sectors intertwine and are creating, well, a kind of future for, for the fashion luxury industry. So I can't wait to deep dive into these topics with you today. And the first question I would like to ask you is really how does your origin story start? How does a tech savvy person like you end up being in the niche of luxury fashion? <laughs> Well, um, I spent uh, my early career as an academic um, in the computer science and AI space, and I was a PhD student at the University of Cambridge. And mm -hmm. like other PhD students, I had very little money. So I was thinking of ways that I could monetize my skill set. And I started my first company called Catalyst AI, which was working with a variety of different companies. And <clears throat> by coincidence, uh, we got the opportunity to work with uh, Burberry um, and we were doing, uh, you know, assortment optimization and markdown optimization with them. And uh, that was really my first exposure to the luxury world. But my exposure to fashion as a whole um, started much earlier than that. My grandfather set up uh, one of the first circular knitting factories in Pakistan. Circular knits are like socks and stuff like that. Wow. And I spent my summers, you know, making marketing videos for him, sometimes spending some time on the factory floor. Um, and that, you know, that the whole aspect of uh, textiles was ingrained into my blood, if you can say that. Um, and then eventually, um, it was just a mission of combining those two worlds and really understanding, you know, what's possible on the AI side and what the challenges were on the fashion side and just finding a way to marry them together. That's incredible. It sounds like you're creating your own tapestry of fashion and tech um, together, <laughs> really following that uh, generational um, industry that you've been in. So that's amazing. So you talk about AI and I think AI right now is like this magic to a lot of us, right? Mm -hmm. um, it works in ways that sometimes surpass um, our understanding. I would love for you to be able to break it down for us to really understand in simple terms, what is AI and how does it work? Why does mm -hmm. it seem like magic? Yeah. I think in order to understand AI, I think it's really, really important to understand you know, the journey of AI and I'll try to be as concise as possible, but Really, the term AI, when it was coined in the 1950s, was about understanding two things. One, it was understanding whether machines could emulate human decision making. And secondly, it was under using machines to help understand how humans make decisions in the first place. So it was like this circular thing, you know, understanding humans better and then also understanding the limits of machines in emulating humans. And this became, you know, uh, an incredibly uh, uh, exciting field in the 1950s. The government had some funding towards it and you had a variety of different people trying to address AI in different ways. So um, at that time, you know, there's no one field called AI. You have a variety of different fields, um, you know, probably 
probabilistic and statistics. You have the people who are really interested in the way that the brain works. Um, you know, you have uh, people who are really interested in something called symbolic logic, which is like, oh, uh, how do we symbolize every different um, concept in uh, the human mind? And these various fields um, were completely separate, but over time they started to converge. Um, and, and that's less important. But what's important to know is that it was this very um, ill-defined field, which had a simple purpose of helping how, understand how human brains work. Now, since then, we know that AI has divorced itself from this idea of emulating, you know, how the human brain works, but rather emulating just human behavior, like this, the output. They're not really, mm -hmm. you know, like chat GPT doesn't emulate the way that a human speaks, you know, it, it, um, at least from the brain perspective, it emulates the output. Um, and over time you get the first field. So the first field is the rule-based system. And this is the first form of AI, let's call it. And in this thing, you know, the important thing to know about rule-based systems is that you have something called variables um, and you have something called rules. And it's just about understanding how those variables relate with rules. So, you know, for example, if, you know, you're a luxury buyer and you go into a store and, um, you know, you like blue and white, uh, you know, let's just say we know that information about you, then the system would say, okay, customer A, based on your preference, is the rule-based system says that if the product has blue or white in it, then we should recommend it to you. That's the simplest form. Uh, moving forward, you have something called machine learning, uh, which you know became very popular. And that was saying, well, let's stick to the variables, blue and white, but what if we didn't have to define the rules? What if we just learned the rules and um, you know by interaction? So we see, hey, customer A has been buying a lot of blue and been buying a lot of white. So maybe we can learn this rule about that. And then you go forward even more and you get to deep learning and they say, well, why blue and why white? What if we could learn both the variables and the rules? And that's what deep learning is all about. And that's the essence of, of deep learning today. So the, the fundamental nature of understanding where AI is today is to understand that both your rules and both how you are being represented is being learned simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what makes it so powerful. Amazing. Thank you for that breakdown. Um, and I think it's very interesting that you mentioned a, an example for fashion because a lot of people in the industry and also big brands are starting to implement big strategies on AI. Mm -hmm. And I would love for you to kind of tell us what you see in this industry and with AI. How can AI become a game changer in the luxury fashion scene? Mm. I think... I think I always um, shy away from saying how AI itself can be a game changer, but rather, you know, what is possible um, now that wasn't possible before because of AI. So, for mm -hmm. example, you know, what at the core are we trying to achieve with luxury fashion or with any fashion, right? It's about the customer and it's about the customer experience, right? Um, you know, most research that studies consumer behavior suggests that experiential um, uh, factors have uh, significantly outweigh any other factor when it comes to a consumer's purchasing decision, even more than price. So it ultimately, um, the goal, if I'm a brand, is how can I redefine and reinvent the consumer experience and serve my consumer better in an era where I'm both trying to understand what my consumer is and using technology to facilitate that that sort of challenge. Um, and for me, I think, you know, the way I think about the way that technology has gone from the beginning of time, it's a, it's been about empowering the next level of creation. And what I mean by that is, if I can give you a counter example, let's just take an example that you probably weren't expecting, but let's just take USSR and Stalin. And if you think about the USSR at the time that it was being created, it was a command economy. And what I mean by that is that every aspect of decision making about what is being produced, how much of it is being produced, was done by a central office. So if you were producing nails, the command economy central office would decide you're going to produce a million nails today. That is all mm -hmm. being done centrally. And that is really essentially the way that fashion has evolved over time as well. It's a command economy. You have a brand that's deciding how much to buy, what to sell, to, to who. But over time, I think the capabilities of technology is that the people who are closer to the consumer better understand the consumer. So a store manager has actually very little say in what gets 
put into the store and how it gets shown. You know, that's the visual, visual merchandiser's job. And then the buying is the buyer's job. But the person who's actually interacting with the customer has very little say. And I think what we'll see with technology over time is that the people on the ground that, you know, a lot of the companies are thinking, wow, we won't need sales agents. Actually, your sales agents become even more important because they will mm. help you determine what your consumer needs and anticipating those needs and then being able to action those needs through technology. And they will, of course, be facilitated through technology to help address and analyze those needs. But I think going forward, you know, the role of the sales agents will become even more important and even more impactful and uh, pivotal in the way that the, the business works in the future. So what I'm essentially saying is we're going to move from a command economy towards a local economy, which is decentralized um, and based on individual stores and individual consumer needs. Mm -hmm. Super interesting. Would you go as far as to say that these kind of technologies will actually enhance human connection and the the personal touch a hundred percent i think one thing for sure is only human humans can enhance a human connection right but what you are able to do is you're able to use technology to uh you know supercharge that human connection to get rid of the a lot of the initial cold start questions like you know, oh, what is this person really looking for? Or what kind of things have they bought before? Or what kind of things do they like? And, you know, what is their usual basket size? And all of these questions will just not have to exist. And you can go straight into, we skip the small talk and go to the deep talk, really. Mm -hmm, and I think mm -hmm. that's what AI promises to be able to do. Uh, and we see that with ChatGPT, you know, your the biggest thing I think personally that ChatGPT has helped with people is not to write incredible essays. I don't think that it's reached that level. What it's able to do is to do the 80% of the initial grunt work that, you know, get something on the piece of paper and then you can refine it and create it into a masterpiece using your own skill set. So mm -hmm. ultimately it's about getting you halfway there and then doing the hard 20% that really humans should be empowered to do. But because of the amount of manual work that people do, most people never get to the 20%. They just do the 80% and submit. But now we can do even better work um, and better quality work. And I think that extends to the way that people behave in the storefront as well. Hmm. Super interesting. In terms of personalization, how do you think AI is rewriting the rules of the experience that we have in this industry? I think that, um, firstly, I think it's, it's important to understand the technical innovations that's happened over the last few years. So, mm -hmm. um, back when, so going back to the example that I gave in the beginning, you know, you had rule based, you had machine learning and you had deep learning, even in the era of deep learning, um, I talked about variables and rules. Now let's for a second, assume that a variable is a human, right? And uh, you're learning a little bit more about that human. And then based on the rules, you then have other variables like products. And the objective is using the rules, match the variable human with the best, you know, products. Now, the challenge is the way that you create variables is very, very important. And in the past, the technology, the models that we were using, I'll name a few of them, you know, LSTM, convolutional neural networks, LSTM stands for long short term memory modules. These were the standard mechanisms to create what's called, well, we call them variables, but in, in literature, they're called representations, like human representations. And the challenge with these variables was that they were suboptimal. Now, I'll give you a very concrete example of how they were suboptimal. So Amazon, it's called the Amazon problem. You go on Amazon and you buy a toilet plunger. You're only going to ever need to buy a toilet plunger once. But for whatever reason, once you've bought it, Amazon thinks, hey, you know, Carlota really likes toilet plungers. Let's continue <laughs> to recommend her toilet plungers, right? right? And that's the problem. The problem is that the module the memory module doesn't understand context over a long period of time. Now, let me add a little bit more context to that. When you are buying at a store, it's not like Facebook or Twitter where every few seconds you're interacting with something. You're having purchases that are very scarce, scattered throughout weeks. If you're, you know, a shopaholic, maybe daily, but mostly, you know, monthly, you know, quarterly, annually. And as a result, there's very little interaction or feedback to understand who you are as a customer and also remembering that that store only has information of you buying at that store or that mm. brand not at all brands so there's that angle as well now 
if you're trying to understand a consumer, how do you learn a consumer that's buying once now and once maybe a year ago? Um, and that's where the challenge of the LSTMs fell short. So it wasn't able to learn what's called long distance relationships. That also has implication on text. So why you see chat GPT as one of the first examples of, you know, the modern chat, the GPT model, which I'm going to get to. So after LSTMs, you have something called GPT models, which is called generative pre-trained transformers. The most important part being the transformer part. That's the model that replaced the LSTM. The good thing about transformers is that it uses mechanism called attention, which allows you to understand longer distance relationships, which is why it's been so effective in text. So LSTM was the prevailing model for text before transformers mm -hmm. and now transformers has taken over. Now the benefit of transformers is that now you're able to understand a consumer over a longer period of time. So suddenly the Amazon problem of toilet plungers becomes less, less of an issue because it sees that, oh yeah, before Carlota bought a toilet plunger, she actually bought a lot of other things. And in the context of all those other things, the toilet plunger is actually just a small, you know, red herring Got and it. let's just ignore it. And that's where we are today. So just being, it's important to develop that level of technicality because it helps you understand, well, what can we do now? So personalization will see incremental improvements, right? It'll be incremental improvements from the perspective of understanding the consumer. And when I say incremental, I don't mean like 1%. I mean, it's still a huge improvement, but it's not changing the game. Now, what will change the game is then how do you take that personalization representation and do something with it, right? And that's where I think things will get interesting because prior to this, the LSTM was not that great. So I don't think that you would have been, you know, reliably able to use it in a way that would really change people's, you know, perception or experience in the store. We've reached that inflection point where the representation is good enough. So now that's just the base. What do you do with it? So, you know, we talked about examples of a store assistant receiving that representation. So the second a, a human walks into the store, they can scan their phone or they can identify themselves in some form. And that representation gets pulled, which then creates a heap of different experiences from, let's think of it as customized, customized advertisements to personalized offers to a personal assistant walking with them, supporting them, depending on what kind of basket size they are um, in you know, conjunction with all the other people in the store. So I think that's sort of the, the way that I think about the personalization uh, framework when it comes to luxury fashion. I think that's such a great way to put it because actually when we think about uh, personalization, it's something that we all want to, I mean, it's, it's one of the, the big uh, crux of, of luxury is to have a hyper personalization and really feel like um, something is catering to you. But as you talked about with not so luxurious toilet plungers, um, I think, yeah, it's so true. Sometimes you just keep on having um, recommendations for things that you really that's it's not understanding what you're wanting. And, and this can can extrapolate to many other things. But as a like, travel and places you've already been uh and maybe you would be interested if it was in a place you had already been but it could have it could have given you another recommendation so um this concept of of longer relation um can you repeat that it was a longer long distance relationships long yeah. distance relationships um not the ones that we actually um have to have uh <laughs> yes, <laughs> when we're in different <laughs> uh, but yeah these long distance relationships um <laughs> cracking the code of the game. Amazing. Futurity Science. Unlock the science of beauty and luxury. Today's episode is brought to you by Futurity Science. Ever wonder about the scientific innovations that are shaping the future of beauty, fashion, and hospitality today? Dive into Futurity Science's Beautiful Futures series. From groundbreaking sustainable materials to cutting-edge sensory experiences, they've got it all covered. Ignite your curiosity and deepen your understanding of how science influences the world of luxury. Uh, I kind of want to switch now into the gears of supply chain management, which I know that you've done quite a lot of work in as well. Um, mm -hmm. And AI for you has helped you build more efficient um, infrastructures for this. Could you talk to us about AI being um, one of the proponents of efficiency and optimization when talking about supply chain? Yeah, and I think I think um, just taking a step back, like why am I interested in supply chain? Well, I think we all have this, you know, um, it's very popular amongst consumers as well as amongst brands to be able to achieve this vision of on-demand 
manufacturing and on-demand, you know, production um, for a variety of reasons, right? You know, full price sale, uh, advanced sale, you know, less waste, sustainability and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that people often forget is that on-demand is often only on-demand for the consumer, not for the manufacturer, especially if there's mm -hmm. like an agreed turnaround time. Um, you know, you want your product in a few weeks maximum. So the manufacturer has to hold some inventory. They have to have some materials there in advance. Um, they can't turn around a product in, in two weeks if the material isn't there. So in that context, my obsession with supply chain is really understanding that relationship. How do we help manufacturers prepare for what materials or what ingredients need to be in the fridge before you start cooking? In this context, what materials do you need before you start producing so that you can cut the production lead times for fashion? Um, you know, and that as all the other benefits, right? On the one hand, you have on-demand manufacturing. On the other hand, you have, um, if you're not an on-demand brand and you are producing at some degree, mass producing some degree of your, of your, of your assortment, then the ability to have shorter lead times and be able to react to actual demand as it's changing and as it's evolving is a huge advantage. It's, you know, unsold inventory is, is easily fashion's biggest problem. Um, you know, if you're a mid-tier brand, markdowns are your biggest problem. If you're a luxury brand, then unsold inventory, you know, is a big challenge and you can't really burn it because that's against the law and mm -hmm. you don't want to just discount it because that will ruin your brand value. So being able to have that reactionary short reaction time is super, super key. So, um, really to understand how do you achieve that, it comes down to understanding, um, you know, each stage of the supply chain and the constraints and then being able to, you know, I think in the, in the, in the most simplest form, what I started off doing in the supply chain was not rocket science. It was simply drawing a straight line from the brand to the, each of the stages of the manufacturing process to say the brand is thinking about producing this. And in, in the beginning, what the brand would do is they would give a, you know, a forecast. They would say, Hey, we're going to produce this for the next year. Um, and then, you know, some brands that were not on their game would just leave it there. And then maybe when they actually make, when they actually buy and issue a purchase order. Um, so I'm, I'm getting a bit technical here. Let me just differentiate the two. So a forecast is not legally binding. So if I share a forecast with my manufacturer, um, it's just saying a heads up. Um, the actual legally binding, um, you know, uh, product or the financial instrument is a purchase order. And a purchase order uh, only gets issued maybe a few days or a few weeks or maybe a few months before actual, uh, you know, X factory day, actual date that it leaves the factory. And that's the only point in time where the manufacturer is legally bound and the brand is legally bound to pay the manufacturer. So the issue is that the time between the purchase order and the delivery date is shorter than the actual time that it takes to make the product. So as a result, the manufacturer has to start making stuff just based on the heads up, just based on the forecast. Right. And as a result, what ends up happening is that um, they don't have the right amount of product. They don't have the right selection of product because the brands changed their mind. And, and that's really where AI becomes useful because what we do is we model um, each product that the brand has forecast and we model what is the probability that this forecast could change. And then based on that risk score, we advise the manufacturer to say, hey, like this is a high risk product. Let's wait, tell the PO. And this is a low risk product. You can go ahead and start producing a little bit of this. Um, and using that mechanism, we're able to still provide short lead times to the brand so they can quickly turn around things, but, um, you know, make sure that the manufacturer doesn't go out of business and also doesn't produce excess material, uh, which is actually, you know, if you go into a manufacturer, it doesn't matter what kind of, whether it's luxury or premium or not, if you, uh, at least a third of their warehouse is dead stock that they can't sell because they did this thing, what I'd mentioned, where they made the product slightly before the PO and then mm -hmm. nobody else wants to buy that product because it's, you know, it's for Louis Vuitton or it's for Givenchy or whatever. So that's the challenge that I'm looking to solve. Um, and then I guess taking a step back, like one thing that I really um, am passionate about is, is individual creativity. And I often feel that the way that the business model is set up in the fashion industry doesn't empower those individual creatives primarily because individual creatives have no bargaining power with the supplier. You know, if they want to get something made, the supplier is like, well, I've got like all these other people who are producing way more than you. Why would I work with you? Right. Um, right. So being able to tackle that problem comes into play as well, because what we see ourselves as is an enabler. Um, we want the idea that I have in my head 
or that we're working towards is, well, maybe one individual creator doesn't have the bargaining power, but a hundred individual creators do. So if we could bulk up those hundred individual creators and make them as one demand signal to the manufacturer, then we can give access to more and more individual creatives. And the reason why I'm so obsessed with that is because when I read this statistic, which blew my mind, is that the top 10 companies in fashion represent 98% of the economic value created in the industry, meaning all of the other small creators only represent 2% of the overall industry, which is horrible for creative creatives, horrible for, you know, competition, for, you know, challenging the norms. Um, that even when you have smaller brands that want to change the way that sustainability is perceived and executed, it doesn't really matter because their impact is so small in the overall industry that they can't actually make a change. So to empower those creatives to be able to grow and prosper both economically um, and, and from their vision perspective is, is the fundamental part of what we're trying to build. Right. Wow. Um, and I love how this also segues exactly right into sustainability, which is one of the the biggest now, um, I mean, North Stars for the luxury industry is to set up a strategy for sustainability that that actually hits all of those ESG points and, and are really uh, making an impact and, and making a positive impact in, in the life of our clients and the life of our planet, right? Mm. So, um, I like, I love that you were talking about dead stock and how to reduce that. And, and really there's like this, this concept around how to have less waste, right? Mm. What are some of the things that you would suggest, um, are maybe the easiest to tackle or the most important to tackle when looking at the power of, uh, technologies like AI to help waste management yeah. in these, uh, sort of yeah. industries. I think first of all, like it's important to remember that not all waste is equal. Right. So mm. um, a, a waste that's in the form of a finished product is much more wasteful than a fabric that's unused because that can still be repurposed. Right. So not all waste is equal and not all risk of waste is equal. So um, so firstly, if you just think about from the finished product going backwards, you know, the number one thing that brands should be doing is reducing the finished goods inventory that they hold at any given point in time. Right. And that's not doing, you know, accounting tricks to find somebody else to hold the inventory temporarily on a balance sheet. That's genuinely not making finished goods until you're absolutely sure or have at least a 70 percent confidence that you can sell it. Um, and that's the first thing. And, and, you know, partly the ability to be able to do that requires shorter supply chain lead times, which is what we're working on. Right. Mm -hmm. Then you move a step back and you're in the actual um, factory, like talk about tier one, that's a cut, make and trim factory, right? They receive the fabric. Um, when I think about sustainability, I don't only think about the waste. I actually also think about workers' rights. I think about, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, holistic ESG, you know, environmental, social governance, you know, all that sort of stuff. Right. And what, and what one of the biggest challenges is if you think about two things in the CMT factory. One is quality and the second is overtime, right? Quality waste, overtime, workers' rights. Why does quality suffer and why do people work overtime? Typically, one of the biggest correlations is delayed fabric to overtime because when the fabric is delayed, the manufacturer still has to hit those delivery dates. So they work overtime and they work excessively fast. And as a result, the quality issues go up as well because they're working faster. So ensuring that your fabric is on time, again, part of that whole lead time reduction strategy that we're working on to make sure the fabric is there on time. So you're not delaying your production and therefore you're producing, um, you know, um, um, much more effectively. The other thing is that if you, you know, I've spent a lot of time in factories in Asia. And I think one of the things that I find is not well known in the brand side of the community is that when people talk about sustainability efforts, um, the let's say the directive might come from the brand, but the execution comes from the manufacturers. They are the ones that are changing their processes. They're the ones that are investing in certain things. And I and the sad part of the whole story is that um, they're also the poorer ones. They're the less rich ones, but they are the ones who have to pay for sustainability. So now if you go to, you know, I was in Bangladesh last year in November and we had the director of the EU textile commission who had basically helped formulate the EU passport issue and everything that comes around with the regulation. 
And they arrived and they basically presented, hey, if you're going to work with the EU, you need to do A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. Now, all these Bangladeshi manufacturers were like, okay, where were we in that conversation? Like, why didn't we have a say in whether or not we can do this in the time scales that you said and what kind of investment and capex they might require for us to upheave our entire factories and change it this way. So one of the uh, one of the challenges in sustainability right now is that there isn't a coordination between all tiers of the supply chain. It's been heavily focused on the brand side without understanding the complexities on the manufacturing side and the capital requirements there. Most factories, um, even luxury factories, are not making a massive margin. Um, you know, they're being squeezed for cost. Um, and as a result, to, for them to make an excessive investment in sustainability is, is a literal challenge. Uh, so figuring out the systemic issues around being able to achieve those goals um, is something that's very nascent right now. And I think it's going to be has to become more important if we are to take this issue more seriously. The second thing I want to talk about is this issue of fast fashion. And I think if we're going to be serious about sustainability, we need to divide that word into two. I don't like the word fast fashion because it really doesn't explain anything. What actually we're talking about are two things, fast consumption and fast production. Fast mm. production is actually a really, really good thing. Why? It allows you to be closer to demand. It allows you to produce less if you need to. It allows you to pay your workers on time because they're working on really short cash flow cycles. Um, and uh, net net, it's better for everyone. It's better for the brand. It's better for the manufacturer. Um, fast consumption is a bad bad thing. And that is a problem with consumer mentality. Um, you know, uh, just because you're buying an H&M t-shirt doesn't mean, doesn't mean that it's your, your, um, you know, contributing to fast fashion. Um, you could buy the H&M t-shirt and wear it for three years, four years, five years. That's up to you. You decide whether you want to go out and buy another t-shirt. Um, and the brands are simply just reacting to consumer needs. So if the consumer is buying less, the consumers are not, you know, wanting to get a variety of different options, then the brand will inevitably have to react eventually to the needs of the consumer. Um, but that's not how things work. So the reality is that, you know, um, we need to tackle those two things separately. We need to actually make faster production and reduce faster consumption. And I think that's how I like to think about, you know, this area of fast fashion. Um, but generally, I think, yeah, sustainability is in this very nascent space. Um, AI is simply just an enabler, um, but it's a systemic problem that is deep rooted in the processes of both supply chain and buying. Right. No, that that um, separation of those two uh, parts of fast fashion is super helpful to understand. I, I'm really interested on what you were talking about, especially, especially on the side of fast consumption, because fast production, as you said, that's amazing. Fast consumption, um, is that something that you think can be also solved in a different way? Um, do you see uh, generations and uh, younger generations and other um, kind of verticals pushing towards a slower consumption behavior? It's a good question. And, you know, I don't know, I don't have the answer to that question. But what I do, what I can do is I can think about other industries and other phenomena around um, behaviors of consumers. And the challenge that I see in the slow fashion movement is I think it's really well intentioned. And I think, you know, in theory, it makes a lot of sense. But if you look at consumer behavior, um, there is very little to suggest that um, slowing down consumption is in anyone's interest. And what I mean by that is if you're a brand and you're a publicly listed brand, your objective is quarterly growth. Um, if you're a manufacturer, you want to, again, produce more units. So by every, uh, if you're an investor, you want your investment to go up. So if you look at mm -hmm. the systemic players in the ecosystem, even you know those so-called ESG funds, they are ultimately still interested in growth and this perpetual growth that is deeply rooted in the capitalism that we live in. Now, if we can upturn and change that system somehow, then yes, slow fashion movement could succeed. But the incentives are all misaligned. 
the brands want you to consume more the manufacturers want you to buy more the investors want you to buy more because it improves their investment so apart from the consumers which honestly are powerful as a collective but have diverging interests it's very difficult to see um, um, a movement that would, res that would in, in the period that we need it to move. I'm not saying in like 50, 60, 100 years, that's not going to be the case. But I think that in the, in, the, in the speed that we need the climate issues to, to be resolved, I can't see consumers changing behavior at that pace. And none of the data suggests so. I know there are pockets of, you know, um, uh, you know anecdotal or growth data around, you know, resale, around repair, mm -hmm. or all these mm -hmm. sorts of things. But even if you take resale, which is like, you know, $150 billion business, it's still a small fraction of the global retail business. Um, and even if it grows at 20% year on year, um, you know, which it hasn't, uh, you're still sort of stuck with a small fraction of the business being tackled that way. So I think it's important for us to take a step back and think, okay, how can we rethink about the issue of consumption? How can we truly understand the benefits of circularity and what are the challenges in achieving those circularity um, and what does that look like and i think you know the ellen MacArthur foundation etc have thought a lot about this um, but really ultimately the challenge comes down to the economics of how you en enable that how do you who funds the return fees who funds the cost of shredding who funds the cost of spinning when it gets recycled um, and there are people far smarter than me who have thought a lot more about this, but I do think it comes back to the supply chain question of, you know, how do we ensure that the supply chain, uh, you know, is improved. I will though one say, say one thing though, that I have been talking a lot about, which is a simple fix. And actually it can improve a lot of these issues to some degree, which is the simplification of fabric decision-making. And what I mean by that is, um, if I'm a designer, I have absolutely no idea on how my design decisions impact the environment. I have no idea. I'm just designing a garment that mm -hmm. I think re re reflects my interests. And I might select a fabric based on feeling it. Um, but I have absolutely no idea if my purchasing decisions are somehow suboptimal. And what I mean by that is, I won't name the brand, but we you know, went through one of the brand's PLM systems, you know, which is a product lifecycle management systems, which lists every product and what fabric they use. And we found that they had 175 different Pantones of black. We found that they had a variety of fabrics that were only, you know, two or five GSM apart. That's the weight of the fabric. And what that means is that each of those fabrics has a different minimum order because when the fabric weight changes, that means you're changing the yarns, which right. has a minimum order requirement. So you're increasing your minimum order quantity because you haven't decided to consolidate these 10 or 15 fabrics, which means that you can actually produce less than you have to. Um, and then, you know, you improve efficiency and you actually improve cost as well. So that simple design to manufacturing connection would solve a lot of those challenges. And, and to add to that, when a brand decides to diversify its fabric selection, the recycling management and post-life post process of that product becomes complex because every product is using a different fabric. Every product right. has a different blend. Therefore, the process of recycling becomes different. So much more complicated. Yeah, yeah, but if you can simplify that process, at least on the fabric level, forget the design, the cut, you can do whatever you want there, but just simplify the fabric selection. You can save money, reduce waste, and improve the probability of recycling. That's such a good recommendation. Uh, and it's completely segueing into uh, my next question, which was uh, if, if a brand is seriously thinking of, of uh, either starting their AI strategy or, or looking at what how can AI facilitate some of their um, goals, what are three focus areas that you think AI can help maximize in terms of impact? So we've talked about some um, in, our, in, in the past in the conversation, but maybe you have three that are just a little bit more uh, pointed at and short so they can remember. I think firstly, uh, understanding the benefits of um, using transformer models to better understand your consumer is really, if you're a brand focused on experience, the really important thing to explore. How can we understand our consumers better? Um, there's like a caveat here, but I'll, uh, I'll mention it very briefly, but you know, this is where 
um, pre-competitive relationships can be incredibly helpful. And that means that you as an individual brand and your competitor, um, you know, they, you both have limited view of that consumer, but if you were to join in a pre-competitive way, the understanding of your consumers, um, you would both equally benefit. It'd be a win-win situation. And then it's just about executing on the, on the actual design and, and experiential piece. So I think at some point I can imagine a scenario or some smart startup that essentially connects all these competitors and say, we're going to, you know, connect your consumer together. So you all understand your consumer better. So I think the ability for AI to really, really change and transform is to change the way you understand your consumer. Very, very important. Um, the second thing I think in the world that we live in today, uh, what good is understanding the personalization, uh, requests of a consumer if you can't act on them. And I think a big part of that in fashion is, you know, um, improving your ability to collaborate intelligently with your supply base, being able to produce faster, have shorter lead times, react to the needs of your consumer. Um, and, uh, that's really a fundamental thing, especially in the scenario where we have high interest rates and holding inventory, super expensive, um, brands should absolutely be looking at how can we reduce our lead times? How can we reduce our inventory? And the third thing is that as we get into this world of, you know, EU passport, provenance, uh, investing in, uh, you know, mechanisms for having end to end transparency, um, through the use of technology and AI, um, when it comes to, um, both, you know, deciding, um, and what I mean by that is not simply just having the visibility of where the product came from, but also proactively deciding where you produce from. Um, and, and, and really just think back to COVID and think back to if it, during COVID brands had the option to have three or four different destinations for the same product type, how would they have behaved when the port in China was closed? How would they have behaved when the LA port was congested? What would they have done differently? And the ability to do real time risk analysis of the, um, you know, source of goods, um, through both the benefit of provenance and through risk modeling um, would, you know, incredible, like completely change the way that, um, you know, brands and manufacturers would work and also significantly de-risk brands to the short fluctuations, which it just seems like with the world we are living in today, that crises are never ending and unexpected and can happen at any time. So brands need to be able to, you know, be prepared to manage that sort of risk through, um, through risk modeling. Mm. Um, and then I guess the final thing I'll say is, you know, all in all, I think AI is just a tool. It has to solve a business problem. It has to solve a need for consumers, for the business, for the whole industry and identifying what the important problems to solve are, you know, plays a big role, um, in, in being able to really see the full advantage of the technology. Great. And on the tech horizon, We've been talking a lot about AI and the, the powerful tool it is. Were there any other innovations in technology that you deem will be disruptive in the next half decade or so? I still do think that despite all the bad press that it gets, um, the uh, capability of certain types of blockchain solutions that are able to uh, track ownership uh, throughout the supply chain. And, and typically, I think when people talk about Web3, they, they really just talk about the creator and the brand, and they talk about mm -hmm. you know the royalties there. Um, I think about the value that it can pass all the way down through each of the you know individual workers and how it could fundamentally change the equation we talked a little bit about, you know, empowering creators, empowering creators to be able to, um, you know, uh, develop and manufacture with better manufacturers, but because their volumes are so small, no manufacturer is interested in taking them. But if you were to say to the manufacturer, hey, like, I know I'm a small brand and I know you're taking a little bit of a risk in me in allocating me some of your capacity. Uh, but what if I gave you a percentage of the royalties? Um, that I would get from the resale and from the, you know, the, the uplift, would you be then willing to take a gamble on me? And, um, 
you know, the example I can give you here is a factory that used to produce for Supreme. And I remember walking into that factory and seeing that those t-shirts were being produced for uh, like 10 euros, you know, or five euros, um, which is still expensive for a t-shirt, but it's for, I mean, on the production side, but it's still nothing, you know, relative to what they were being resold for. Right. right. And in that context, I think if the manu uh, you know, the manufacturer um, has any idea of that, this is going to be a resold sort of product, how would they have behaved differently across other potential Supremes or other potential small drop products. Um, I guess my mind has been constrained in the fashion industry, but in general, I think if there was a technology and I don't know if it's going to be in the next half decade that I'm really curious about, it's quantum. And primarily because it fundamentally changes the way that we uh, think about um, machine learning, deep learning. I think the main thing that main takeaway around quantum um, is that, um, I, th I think one, well, I'll give one example that will, that will be illustrative of what I mean. So in uh, probability theory, we have this idea of randomness, right? So we can generate things randomly. And then this, this randomness is great because it allows us to explore new paradigms in the search space of mathematics. And for example, if I'm trying to learn, you know, Carlota's preferences, um, and I have no idea about what you like, I might initialize randomly some sort of idea. Maybe, okay, I'll start with toilet plungers, for example, just because we used that example before. But we'll <laughs> randomly generate some sort of you know, interface. And then we'll use that random spot to then learn where you actually belong, right? Now, in digital computers, in the computers that we have today, there is no such thing as true random. It's an emulated random, but it's not true random. And as a result, you know, the whole idea of brute forcing a password hack or um, you know converging at an optimal machine learning model is actually pseudo random but with quantum you have true random so i think that can really change the way that we learn about people that we learn about systems that we train models of personalization uh, about supply chain because then we can really capture the nature of random and then use it to better learn models and if you ever hear people saying that oh with quantum computing our technology and security infrastructure will fail that's true because um, you know, right now, if you want to brute force a password for the nuclear codes in the U.S., like it's going to take you a million, million years. But with randomness, true randomness, you could reach that much quicker. Um, and that's mm. really, you know, has really serious consequences, but actually has really interesting use cases uh, across many industries, including fashion, when it comes to understanding supply chains and people. All right, so we're at our last question, and this is a very exciting question to me always. Um, let's imagine that you have in your hands the highly coveted crystal ball that we all wish we had. If you could jump to 2035, how do you envision the luxury landscape? Is there any utopian dreams you have for this era? I'll tell you what I dream and then I'll tell you what I think will happen. What I Great. dream is for um, for a more level playing field when it comes to different brands where, um, you know, more, um, more creatives, more true creatives can rise up and, um, you know, uh, innovate from the fashion perspective, from the creation perspective, and uh, that the supply chain and the mechanics and physics of manufacturing support those creatives, which they don't currently. Um, so I do feel that I see a future from that, from a systemic perspective, from a technology perspective, I'm a big supporter of breaking down the command economy into a localized decentralized economy where individual storefronts have a much greater say through technology on how things are purchased. I think that um, this idea of, um, you know, buying online versus buying in store um, doesn't make any sense. And I think in the luxury space, if, you know, without being too specific, I think we've seen that, you know, the stock market of certain luxury retailers have been skyrocketing in the negative direction. Um, mm -hmm. And <laughs> primarily because there's been a lack of understanding of, what is it that they're offering? The novelty of buying online is no longer a novelty. And therefore, how do you recreate the experience online and in store? So I see that there's going to be a true convergence of physical and digital, you know, whether it's, and I think it's beyond just the physical being a marketing space. I think it's beyond that. I think it's something even more um, uh, immersive 
um, which I hope will happen. And I think in, in moving towards what I think will actually happen, I think that the change that we are looking for in in society, in fashion, um, will not come as fast as we hope. I think there's probably going to be a consolidation of luxury brands more than they've already had. So, you know, we've got the LVMH carrying and Richemont. I think we'll see more groups like that, specifically in Italy, where there's still not a group that exists like that. Mm -hmm. um you know uh brands are struggling individually so there's going to be um, a greater consolidation of those but you know that's just that's the negative pessimistic side of me but i i really hope that i'm wrong i really hope that we can have um you know a true uh you know greater not true but a greater amount of fostering of creative capabilities um and that, you know, fashion remains to be a, a, a mechanism of expressing yourself. And I think we've sort of lost our way in that way for a while. You know, I, when Absolutely. I speak to like older designers, like I randomly found myself at dinner with uh, Dav David Sassoon and Zondra Rhodes, and I had no idea who they were, but I looked them up after. Well, I was in the bathroom <laughs> looking them up. I'm like, oh, wow, cool. Like Dan is designer. Um, and I asked them, I was like, you know, who is your favorite designer? Who is the best designer do you think? that you know has 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 lived in the past few years or you know is living and the only name they they said to me that was like you know since Alexander McQueen I can't really think of somebody who's really taken the world by surprise and really changed the way things work i would personally say you know virgil abloh um but i don't think that that's their sort of space but you know i hope that we can see people taking fashion back to where it, it came from which is a form of self expression and art an art form and uh, less, you know, pandering to the needs of the consumer in the most, you know, singular commercial way possible. Um, but, you know, maybe I'm just being a bit too critical, but yeah. That's great. I love that. And I love that uh, little um, side uh, story on, on you sitting next to them. That's great people to be sitting next to randomly at a dinner. Um, <laughs> but that, I, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. I know it's hard sometimes to project um, a long time from now. Um, and so that's really why I I always say let's create and let's not predict nor project. So um, I, I really loved speaking to people like you because I think that you are uh, a part of that creation of the future of this industry. And that's always so um, impactful and powerful. So Ahmed, thank you so much. This has been an incredible conversation. Thank you so much for sharing all of your insights and examples. How can listeners stay updated to your research and your work that you do? Is there any way they can keep in contact or follow you? Uh, I mean, I'm on Instagram uh, and Twitter, which I use less so, but um, I'm, my handle is like underscore Ahmed Zaidi. Um, but yeah, I mean, I hope I will be making more content soon as, you know, things progress on my end. But, you know, I want to share something when I have something useful to share. So amazing. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and catch you next time. Thanks, Carlotta. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Beyond Luxury podcast today. If you found this episode insightful or inspiring, make sure to review, subscribe, and join in on the conversation in the comments. You know, they say the best way to predict the future is to create it. And together, through rigorous dialogue and curiosity, we can craft the future landscape of luxury. So don't just be a listener, be a part of this transformative journey. Until the next episode, Stay inspired and keep pushing those boundaries.